initially we started with 100 students and in 12 different schools, because you never know. It's a documentary. You don't know where you're going to find the interesting story. And as we got further into it, the film team particularly loved the two leads, you know, Brian and Samantha. So we were pretty locked in on them. But we were actually hoping that Brian was going to pull it off and finish in time for exhibition night. Because, you know, we're saying, like, you know, you, you really, you know, you don't want to end it on a down note. And so I was getting these texts every hour that day from my film team saying, initial was not looking particularly good, you know, <laughs> not looking at all good, uh, really, really don't think this is going to happen, uh, you know, didn't work. And then we like spent three days in mourning saying, well, you know, we could put a good spin, you know, life's like that, sometimes people try out, sometimes they don't. And then we just got this, you know, lightning in a bottle phenomenon where Brian didn't give up and it just adds this element. And I always apologize, I, you know, I've seen this film so many times, I generally you know, and don't sit through the whole thing, but I, I always watch. I've seen the end of this now, you know, 150 times, and, but I'm outside of the auditorium, and somebody will have to get, you know, like, a babysitter or something will leave, but there's, like, five minutes to go, and I, like, beg them. I say, you know, please go back in. You don't want to leave and miss. It's not what you think. I represent Abiquinemix School District. I'm the principal of an elementary school. Um, my assistant principal and myself for many years have been trying to convince our district with stepping out of the box and moving along in this direction. And with the coming of STEM and project-based learning and the media hype over the past two years, we have been given the sign of the cross and been given the grace of God and say, go for it on an elementary level. I, ha I actually have my team here that we're redesigning their roles as teachers. Um, we're pulling teachers out of the classroom, designing coaches. Um, so I guess my question to you, because we feel, we, I'm going to speak for myself, we taint children from kindergarten. What is your philosophy about doing this on an elementary level? And I can say we're starting it and we are seeing amazing things that children are doing. And not just our high children, all low children yeah. are rising to the table. You know, we, we settle on ninth grade, which, which in some ways I'm really glad we get because it's young enough and still is approachable for K through six. But it's far enough along, it still resembles aspects of college. But I think if you look at what these kids are doing, and you went to a kindergarten, you went to a Montessori school, it would look very similar, right? And, and I think the, I think K through six would do a really great job if they weren't being leaned on to prepare kids for seven through eight, who's being leaned on to prepare kids for high school, who's being leaned on to prepare kids for a college application. And so it all kind of ripples down from there. And um, you know, I, we, you know. We generally find when we when we visit a lot of K through sixes, there there's a lot that's great with this going on there, and that I think where it gets all you know sort of buzz when it's you know I've got my I wrote I'll, I'll plug it I wrote a book with Tony Wagner and uh, with the same title that we got this example of Elmwood El, uh, K it's an elementary school in New York and they it's it's in the book the letter they sent home to the parents saying they are canceling the kindergarten annual play because it's taking time needed for career and college preparation. <laughs> I'd like to know what you think is going to accelerate the pace of that change and what you think the greatest barriers are in our society right now to that acceleration. Yeah. This is a great question. So I'll, yeah, sure. You know, if, if you didn't hear it, it was a great question. So, <laughs> and I can't do it justice, but it was, it was what are the barriers to accelerating this? You know, and, um, you know, because it, honestly, I I am worried to death, right? I mean, I think you can see some of the some of that concern show up in the beginning of the film. But but if, if I had a couple of takeaways from my time adventure, it is that the pace of innovation is ruthless, and it's not tapering off, it's not linear, it's accelerating, it's exponential. And so, if you think about the amount of change and disruption in our society in the last ten years. Now remember, 10 years ago, smartphones didn't even exist. A whole wave of companies didn't exist. A whole wave, wave of jobs that used to be there are now gone. The amount of change in the next 10 years will be five to 10 times that. And so if we, you know, and innovation is not sitting around saying, oh, it's gonna take us a while to get schools to change. Let's just slow down. Let's just wait for the schools to catch up. I mean, it doesn't work that way. And so I do believe it's urgent to change it. And you know, there are good things that are driving that, but I also think there are concerns. And I think you're seeing a lot of, well, what I find is that 
All too often, even the people that excel, the young kids that excel in our school system, come out of school so conditioned to jump through hoops that they are back at home, living with their parents, not quite sure what to do. And, and I think that there's gradually a sense of urgency. And, and I have to say, when I started this, I'm traveling real out, so you wouldn't, you know, my schedule's crazy, but when I started this process, I was pretty pessimistic. You know, I said it's a huge problem. It's been the same way basically for 125 years. I think it's a long shot we'll get much change. I'm a lot more optimistic now. And, and the reason is I think people are angry. I think people are worried. I think everybody instinctively, if you ask the question, are schools working or not working? The average person says they're not working. Now, the other thing that would you say, what do you think we should do differently? There's a lot of confusion on that. And I, I, I feel like if we can deliver a message or something, it's what I loved about the film. I, I, I wasn't the director, but it's, it shows the possibilities. It shows what teachers and students are capable of if we put them in the right circumstances, if we let them work on things they care about. We gave the next generation the biggest set of challenges we failed to step up to, right? We have not shortchanged kids on major problems they're gonna have to solve in their lifetime. So, so the least we can do as adults is give them an education that really prepares them to solve problems in an innovative, creative way instead of to just jump through the loops. So. Ted said a bunch of great things today, and I've had a wonderful day riding around with him. But one thing he said t today that just really hit me, and I, it just, I never thought about it that much, but you mentioned something that, you know, what if tomorrow all the fast food chains in the United States were all automated? My God, and that, that's probably not far away. Uh, and you imagine the numbers of kids and people that rely upon that. Uh, and so it, it really hit home when you said that to me. Well, thanks. If you look at teachers at places like Newtown and Sandy Hook that would put themselves in front of a kid to save that kid's life, and every day we're trusting teachers with the lives of our kids, it sure seems to me we ought to trust them to teach the way they enter the profession to teach. Amen. And I do worry. You know, I always say, show me a kid that's been unemployed for three years and I show you a huge societal long-term problem. You know, we've got my film team's about done with the short, where a uh, traditional public school in Central Virginia, they saw the film in April. In August, they had an entirely different track, and about a fourth of the entering freshmen are all doing things that look a lot more like what you saw in the film. And they, you know, it's too early to tell, but they particularly targeted kids in seventh and eighth grade where they said there is real issues about whether this kid will graduate. And I, I think for some kids it's just really, really hard. I'm not sure there's anything you can do in terms of the, the pedagogy, you know, where kids really suffering and fighting through some really difficult issues. I do feel though that on the margin, I see this across a lot of different examples, where once the work they're doing in school is far more interesting, you, you will, on the margin, you'll reach two, kid, two types of kids. One that was just so bored or school didn't work for them, but I also think, and I'm actually a, a big fan of, you know, what's the acronym, CTE or vocational, because I actually think when I see kids doing things, hands-on learning, I often find they're learning more fundamental science or math or even history or English can be taught really effectively there than kids taking pure science courses. And so I feel like in some ways America has it the wrong way, that, that we should be having all kids do more hands-on learning and you know, and that will benefit you whether you are a PhD in physics or an electrician or just an adult having to deal with a fuse box. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not terribly athletic, so I was always like the mediocre to the last kid pick. But nevertheless, I love it. You know, but but I think you find a you learn the relationship between hard work and improvement. You are exposed to repeated instances of failing and having to get back up on your feet. And so I think that's why people who do have been through athletic experiences often do quite well in life, um, even though many struggle with school. Uh, the, the thing that I think is a big opportunity that we miss is tying almost every kid's passion about some sport. There are these enormous opportunities to leverage that passion to help them with other aspects of, of their educational development. And so, you know, I'm a backer of a, um, it's an amazing story, but a, a kid who uh, grew up in South Central LA as a sophomore in college, he had trouble with math. He started a nonprofit to tie math to basketball. He's got 100,000 kids across America learning math in the context of basketball. He's got the Denver Nuggets, the Golden State Warriors, and the Cleveland Cavaliers going into assemblies, talking to kids in K-8 schools across those cities, in the inner city, 
telling them, I make my living playing basketball, you've got to know your basic math if you're going to be good at basketball. And these kids will make three grade levels of advance in a single year because they're interested. And you know, and that's my whole, over and over, I just say, give a kid a reason to learn it. They'll blow you away with what they're capable of. Pile in with sheets of worksheets in front of them and say, trust me, someday this may come in handy. And they'll do what anybody rational would do, which is to say, I'm not that interested. And, and so, you know, we, that's our opportunity. If we can have more in front of kids that they're really excited about, that they want to take on, hold them to high standards, I think we could see amazing things out of this school.